In this section, we're going to cover what we call the fundamental theorem of calculus. And as you can guess, with a title like that, it's pretty darn important. Basically, what we've done in the last section is we presented motivation for what an integral is to give you that warm, fuzzy feeling of, of what it represents more than anything else. Here we're going to start to learn about how you actually calculate integrals and, and sort of what the big picture is there. The fundamental theorem of calculus really gears, uh, is geared around telling you how to basically calculate integrals. So we're going to learn a little bit more about here and then we're going to do a lot of problems in subsequent sections to give you that practice. So the fundamental theorem of calculus, there's a couple of things I need to write down because they're in all the textbooks and you know you need to make sure that this is true anytime you're doing an integration. So you're going to let some function f of x uh, be continuous. Continue o u s on some interval a b. So what this means is that your function is smooth. There's no jumps, right? So because you can't have crazy functions where it goes up and then it just discontinuous jump down some other value, right? Like some piecewise defined function or something. So basically what you mean here when you, when you look at this in a book is it means smooth functions. That's what a continuous function is. Nice smooth changes. I mean they can be steep and all. You just can't jump discontinuously from one point to the other. So it has to be continuous on the entire interval that you're uh, integrating over in order for integration to work. The second little thing is we're going to let something called the antiderivative, and I'll explain what that is, derivative of f of x be denoted as capital F of x. Notice the function we're integrating is f of x, little, little uh, f. The antiderivative, which I need to explain in a minute, is denoted by a capital F. All right. Once you let those two things be true, then the following can be defined. <clears throat> because if you don't have a continuous function, uh, then you can't do any of this stuff. Then the integral from a up to b of f of x dx, which we talked about what all this part means, is equal to the antiderivative of f evaluated at the top limit of integration minus the antiderivative evaluated at the bottom limit of integration. This, believe it or not, is actually the fundamental theorem of calculus. And there is a picture that goes along with it, so let me make sure I can draw the picture for you real quick. So if we're looking at x, and this is f of x, you know, our function can be anything we want as long as it's continuous. It can go, you know what, let me change color. Our function can, can do something like this. Whoa, up high and then down low like this. All right. And what it's basically saying is, if I pick a point A, and I pick a point B, then to find the area underneath this curve, all the way from A to B, like this, you're going to take the integral of the function over dx from A, the lower limit of integration, up to B, the upper limit of integration, and in order to get the answer, you're going to find something called an antiderivative, which I need to explain what it actually is, but it's, it's another function, basically, that's denoted by capital F, and then once you do that, you evaluate the antiderivative at the top limit of integration, and you subtract the antiderivative evaluated at the bottom limit of integration. So what you're doing is you're getting a number, because when you do this integration, you're going to get a function called the antiderivative. You evaluate it at the top, minus evaluating the same antiderivative at the bottom, bottom limit of integration, and what you arrive at by the fundamental theorem of calculus is the surface area of this original curve between A and B. And that is basically the bottom line of what it is. So all of this stuff about integration and calculus really boils down to being able to find out what F is, the antiderivative, because that's really the, the work. Once you do that, Doing the subtraction and evaluating A to B is very, very simple. That's just simple algebra. Finding the F, the capital F, the antiderivative, is, is, is the part that's a little bit tricky. But it's very easy to explain the concept of what an antiderivative is. So let me do that right now with some practical examples. All right? So let me give you some examples of what an antiderivative is. So uh, let me just title this antiderivative. Or you could just say integral. It means the same thing. So let's say you have a function, f of x, is equal to 3. A very simple function. This is a function that's a constant. 
It's just a flat line uh, for all values of x. Okay, so let me put a little double arrow here and the antiderivative is going to be over here. Antiderivative. Let me just write one of these guys and then I will teach you what it means. So the antiderivative <coughs> is going to be called capital F of x and in this case it's going to be equal to 3x. So what it is is we start with a function and we come up with a new function called the antiderivative. Notice it's a function of x, just like the original guy, even though there's no x here, it's still a function of x, it's a constant. So we go from here and we map it into over here when we find something called an integral, capital F, and it's also a function of x. It's called an antiderivative. So why is that the case? So let me switch colors here. <clears throat> so here's the antiderivative, and because, in other words, why is this the antiderivative? It is the antiderivative because if we take what we have here, 3x, and we take the derivative again, what is the derivative of 3x? You should remember that from earlier. The derivative of 3x is 3, which is back what we started with. So here, finally, now that I have an example on the board, I can explain what an antiderivative is. Basically, you have, you have antiderivatives and derivatives in calculus. So if you have a function, let's just say my fist is a function, right? Then whenever I take its derivative, then I can go down here and I have a new function called its derivative. If I take the antiderivative of what this is down here, I'm going to arrive at what I start with, right? So antiderivatives and derivatives are opposites of one another. If I start at 3, then basically I'm trying to figure out, for the antiderivative, I'm trying to figure out what function exists such that if I take its derivative, I get back what I started with. That's what's called an antiderivative. So you're going from one level up to another. So here's your function. You go up to the antiderivative, and the reason this is the right answer is because if you take the derivative of this new function you made up, you need to get back what you started with. That is what an antiderivative is. So if you start with 3, this must be the only antiderivative that exists, you know, here, because if I take the derivative of 3x, like this, I'm going to get back what I started with. So let me show you a couple of more examples. And there is more to it than this, okay? I'm, I'm going to get into more details in a few minutes, but this is basically the idea. What if I had another function, f of x is equal to x? So this is a clear function of x. Don't forget that looks like a, a 45 degree angle line, like this. So what would be the antiderivative of this? You're trying to find a new function such that if you took the derivative of this new function, you would get back what you started with. So the antiderivative, f of x, is, I'll just tell you, give we're getting practice here, 1 half x squared. 1 half x squared. That's the only one that works because if I take 1 half x squared and I take the derivative of this, notice this prime mark means derivative, what's the derivative of this? You have 1 half times 2 comes down 2x. So 1 half times 2x is going to give you x because the 1 half and the 2 just go out to give you 1. And notice that what we arrived at, x, is exactly where we started. Let me do one more and then I think you'll see the nice pattern here. What if I had f of x is equal to cosine of x? What would be the antiderivative of cosine? Uh, well, thinking back to what we've learned in calculus 1 with derivatives, the only thing that really works here is the sine of x. That's the only function that really works there. And the reason is because if I take this function, sine of x, and I take its derivative, what's the derivative of sine? The derivative of sine is the cosine function, which is exactly what I started with. So basically when you start with a function, right, you start with a function and you're trying to find its antiderivative, all you're trying to do is figure out what function exists so that if I write that function down, if I were to take the derivative of this function back again, I would get the original function back. So I like to use my hands to kind of gesture. Here's your original function. You take the antiderivative and you go up to this level because if I were to take the derivative of this guy, I would be back to where I started with. Antiderivatives and derivatives are basically opposites. You go up to get to the antiderivative, and if you take the derivative of this guy, you go right back down to your original function again. So there really is a unique function that satisfies this guy. And here's three quick examples. Now, these are examples that I've specifically chosen because they're so easy for you to check. You know, you can get this, you can kind of do them in your head. I mean, even though it's very difficult at first when you first learn integration to do this kind of thing quickly on paper, 
Um, I think you can, you could, if you stared at this long enough, you would figure out that that was the function that would work. If you stared at this long enough, you would figure out that that's the function that would work because these are simple. But if I give you a complicated function, you know, x squared plus 3x over sine of x or something like that, it was going to be difficult for you to figure out what the uh, antiderivative is ahead of time. Uh, in fact, I would say impossible for most students. I mean, I could easily give you a problem that you would not be able just to look at like that. So most of the rest of this course is going to be all about techniques, different techniques people have developed over the years to find these antiderivatives. Because these are super simple, but I'll give you some in a minute that won't be so simple. And then you'll just need to learn how to identify the problem type and figure out how to attack it to get the antiderivative, you know, to get the integral that you're trying to get in the problem. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is a, a few more definitions because as you go through your book and your class, you'll definitely see these. The first one is called a definite integral, which actually I've already showed you. I just didn't call it that. A definite integral, uh, it uh, has limits. And I'll show you what that means in a minute. And it returns a number. A number. And this will be cleared up quickly with a single example, a single super, super fast example. Basically, a definite integral, an example of one, would be like the integral from 1 to 4 of the number 3 dx, right? And so basically what you do is you take the integral of this guy, and, or the antiderivative, and you're going to get some function f. You're going to evaluate it at the number 4 and you're going to take that same antiderivative and evaluate it at the number one. And then what you're going to get is a number, right? Because the antiderivative of this is known. We can calculate that. We can evaluate it at four. We can evaluate it at one. When you do this evaluation at numbers, you're just getting numbers. So what you're going to get at the end is a number, a number. So a definite integral. It's called definite because it has limits of integration. And when you do the integration, you're always going to get a number back. It's definite. It's defined to be between two points like this. Okay? Now, the reason that's important is because there's something else that's very similar called an indefinite integral. Has no limits. And it returns a function. All right? So that's very simple to understand also. And that would be something like the integral of x squared dx is equal to, what do we get? Well, there's no limits of integration here, but we can still take the antiderivative. When you see this guy wrapped around less, what you're trying to find is the antiderivative here. So what you're going to get, I'm not going to go through the math behind it, what you're going to get is a function. which is called the antiderivative, right? So let me write that down, the antiderivative. All right, so I'm done writing uh, everything I want to write on the board here for this lesson. Basically, there's two classes of integrals. You'll be learning how to do both of them. They're, they're basically the same thing. If you have an indefinite integral, it means there's no defined limits of integration. If you see something like this, you just calculate the antiderivative, which we're going to get lots of practice doing, and the answer that you get is just going to be a function. It's just going to be the antiderivative of whatever you had in here. That's the answer we're looking for, right? Because sometimes when you're doing calculations, uh, you just want to get that antiderivative there. Now, sometimes you're trying to find a number. You're trying to calculate the surface area under the curve and get an actual number. So then you put your limits of integration down, and when you do the integration, you're going to get an antiderivative, but you'll evaluate it because of the fundamental theorem of calculus. You'll evaluate it at the top limit minus evaluating it at the bottom limit, and then you'll get a number out of it. So that's basically it. So this concludes this part of what I'm going to call the fundamental theorem of calculus. I wanted to kind of explain that basically what it means is you take your integral, you find your antiderivative, and you evaluate it at the limits of integration. Um, but what we've done so far is a little bit of hand waving on how to actually find the antiderivative. So don't stress out if that doesn't make sense to you yet, as I haven't taught you that yet. I just want to conceptually tell you, if you start with a function and you find the antiderivative, you're going to come up to some level here such that if you were to take the derivative of this, you would get back to where you started. So antiderivatives and, the, and derivatives, they're basically opposites of one another. And that's why they're very important. So 
follow me on to the next section. We'll get a little practice applying this fundamental theorem of calculus to kind of show you how you would get it done. And then in subsequent sections, we're going to look at class by class of problems and show you how to actually calculate uh, these integrals here. So a lot of what we're doing now is definitions and fundamental things. Pretty soon we'll just be doing problem after problem after problem, but I want to make sure you get a good grounding so that you understand where we're going. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.